however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long yes, because true pressers will rise again. Yes, sir. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. I've also decided to stick with love, but I know that love is ultimately the only answer to mankind's problems. I'm going to talk about it everywhere I go. I'm talking about a strong, demanding love. But I have seen too much hate. And I say to myself that hate is too great a burden to bear. I have decided to love. of his terrible swift sword, yes, his truth is marching on. Yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Yes, he is lifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes, oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, hallelujah. That's the God raises up men and women to fulfill assignments that he brings to earth. And I'm very thankful looking around this room today, we get to be a taste of heaven. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you taste pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I want to thank you for praying for my father. I don't know if he's watching this service. He was watching my dad on Friday. He's called Pastor Dad around here. My dad on Friday uh, had to have open heart surgery. Uh, it was something that actually a year and a half ago they found an aneurysm at the top of his aorta up above the heart. And uh, he prayed about it for a year and a half. <laughs> he didn't want to, he, he said, I'm going to let Jesus heal me. And then he realized God had given, uh, you know, a gift of healing. How many appreciate our doctors and the medical? God's given them a gift of healing. Whether they acknowledge it or not, I'm glad for friends that acknowledge they know where their gift has come, has come from. But uh, on Friday, they actually opened him, did a, a heart surgery, and uh, had to um, uh, take his heart out and then put, go up, and they took care of that. And uh, I, we were all there, and then um, Saturday morning, the doctors came in and began to tell my brother and mom, they said, you know, your dad, we're, we're really amazed how strong your father is, and his tenacity is even stronger. And uh, it's actually miraculous what he's, his recovery is, they deemed it miraculous. And when they said that... Um, my dad was, of course, laying there, and, he, and when he said that, he sounded like a little Lou Engle going on because he had that, you know, the, the air inside of him, and he said, well, I know the God of the miraculous. So, and I went, there you go, Dad. And uh, so thank you for praying for him, and Dad, if you're watching, we love you. Would you just welcome my dad? Would you do that? That man is my hero. He and Mom. And uh, I'm thankful for that. Take your Bibles, open with me to John 21. John 21, next Sunday night, we'll be having a Sunday night encounter, 5 o'clock. Don't want to miss, we've had some powerful encounter nights on Sunday nights, the last two Sunday nights. And uh, we're not going to miss the one at the end of this month. And you're going to be hearing more about that through this year. Uh, but uh, we're coming, and on f next Sunday night, we're going to be laying hands on people, believing for healing. We're going to... Uh, just just pray for those that are really going through difficult moments and the scripture says that we would lay hands on the sick and they would recover God said that that's his word. How many know we need to practice that? So we'll, we'll be doing that on uh, next Sunday night five o'clock. You don't want to miss it, but John 21 
I want to speak to you today on what I call when rest rules. But in John 21, verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way he showed himself, Simon Peter, Thomas, the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, well, we're going with you. They went out and immediately got into a boat, and that night they caught nothing. What's interesting is that phrase, I am going, in the Greek has a very intriguing translation. Here's what it means. It means to withdraw or retire. It actually means to sink out of sight or disappear. It literally, if you, if you put it in its complete context, it means I retire, I quit. Peter goes back to the life he once knew. He jumped into this thing and he fishes all night, catches nothing. Actually, when Jesus found him, he was in the same place. He kind of expressed what it was like that night. And he said in Luke 5, when Jesus first found him, he used this phrase. He said, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But yet at your word, I'll let my nets down again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I ask you in these next few moments, would you just allow me once again in this second service, Lord, to be like the pen of a writer, to write your heart. Speak to us today, to everyone that's in the sound of my voice, that Lord, this year would not be just another year. It wouldn't be just a, a year of making resolutions. But Lord, there would be some pure resolves. Some things would resolve in our life. We, we would see things strengthen that really felt like were taking us out. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The word toil actually means to work extremely hard, incessantly. It, it, it's a, it, it derives from a verb that means to drag or to struggle. Toil. God never made you to be someone who toils in life. There's a difference in work and toiling. Working is, he that doesn't work doesn't eat. I mean, we're called to work. Even God worked six days, five, six days, but on the Sabbath, on Shabbat, he rested. But what does it mean? Have you ever wanted to just disappear? Anybody ever just wanted to kind of exit left, kind of, get away and kind of disappear. I mean, as if no one, I, I've had moments in my life where Lisa and I have actually, you know, when it seemed like everything was kind of coming in around you all at once, because it never just comes in one direction. If you get hit once, get ready. You're about to get hit another place. I'm not trying to give you some heavy revy. I'm just saying that's just reality. And man, there've been times when stuff has just circled the wagons. And you're like, you know what? Wouldn't it be great if we just kind of disappeared from Huntsville and went out to the boonies somewhere, found a little bitty church with about 20 people, and just loved them till Jesus came? I mean, would, would it, you know, you just wanted to, have you, has anyone in this room wanted to, last year, did you want to quit? Did you just find a few things? You just said, I'm done. I'm retiring. You can't, you're like, you're 25. Yeah, but I'm retiring. You know, like one day you're rejoicing, you feel secure, but the next, this unexplainable feeling of worthlessness, worthlessness comes over you. And suddenly, for no reason, your peace is gone. You're plagued with restlessness. You get despondent. You feel depression trying to set in. You feel undeserving, unholy, unacceptable. You feel like God has kind of turned his back on you. Has anybody ever been there? That's what it means to toil. So many have been toiling for so long, they've actually become emotionally unplugged. You go through the motions. Maybe you just feel like you're going through the motions in your marriage, your job. 
You're just maintaining the pretense of some kind of relationship with your children or, or maybe your parents. But inside, emotionally, you feel like I've unplugged, I've given up, I'm detached. You see, that's what Peter was saying. He was saying, I'm done. I'm retired. I'm going to disappear back on the Sea of Galilee. I'm getting out of all the hype of this mess, and I'm going back to what I used to do. But the moment you get back to who you used to be is the moment you can fish all night, toll all night, but you'll never catch anything that will satisfy what only he can do. Never. See, what the enemy does is one of his strategies is to try to emotionally wear us down. So many are tolling. They're fed up. They want to give up because they're living to produce instead of be. The old cliche, God made us human beings, not human doings. Always living overwhelmed, overcome. And if the enemy can't cause you to live in some blatant sin, then he will attempt to push you over the edge by wearing you down with weariness from toil and trouble. I don't know, I don't know why I just did that voice. But every time I hear that toil and trouble, I think about that old Disney. All right, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, it's this grind. It is this like dragging you through things. It's like Job. I mean, here's Job. He even spoke of his precious wife after his wife said to him, hey, are you still holding on to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Are you still pretending you're strong? Are you still pretending you're courageous? He lost everything. Are you still trying to be truthful to hold on to this? Listen to what he said in verses 10. To, the, you, here's kind of a snapshot of what he was facing. He was tolling through this. He was being dragged through the mud in all of these attacks. And I'm actually reading from the King James. I don't use the King James much because I don't speak it like that if, anymore. If. Actually, I never did it. <laughs> but I started, I, I, I wrote this in the King James because I thought, you know, that's kind of, you know, what does he mean? Because it says, Hast thou not poured me out like as milk and curdled me like cheese? I'm full of confusion. Now listen, I'm from Winston County. I'm like, what is he saying? So in my language, here's what he's saying. Hey, Lord, you stirred up my life and I've gone sour and I'm confused. And then he, he brings it out again. He said, oh, wherefore well, hast thou hid thy face and holdest me for thine enemy? Here's what he's saying. Hey, God, you got my children, you got my stuff, you got everything I have, except you left me this precious wife, so why have you become my enemy? And if you're from the South, it's enema. And that is not your friend. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. He goes on verse 16, chapter 16. He says, my face is foul with weeping. And on my eyelids sends the shadow of death. What he's really saying is, is I'm crying so much, my eyes are redder than a mosquito bite on a hot summer day. And my face just looks like a dead man. How many have ever felt that way? You're tolling through something. You're being drugged through the mud. You just want to quit. You want to disappear. Jeremiah, the prophet, he said, oh, Lord, you have delivered, you've I feel deceived. I'm, I'm in derision. He even went on to say, Lord, curse be the day where I was born. Curse is the man who brought tidings even to my father that a man-child was born, he ended up saying, I wish you had just taken my life when I was born. Man, that doesn't sound like a fearless prophet. It sounds like the struggle of a man with faith. He was so overwhelmed by the trouble and affliction that he wished that he would just had died. Look at Elijah. I mean, one of the greatest stories in the Bible 
Here he prays for it not to rain. It doesn't rain. He prays for it to rain. It rains. He has this rumble with the, all of the, the prophets of Baal, 400. He's able to take out. Revival should be hitting Israel. And one woman called Jezebel rises up against him. And for 40 days, he runs for his life. And he begs God, would you please let me die? He had no ability to reach back in the memory of just days early and remembering how God, how God had been faithful. See, there are moments in our life, it's hard to turn the pages. I said earlier, back to, the, to even praise him for what he's done because what you're looking ahead is that everything is jumbled on the page in front of you. It's blurred. Your life is being drugged through in its toil. It's just... You just want to quit. You want to say, God, I gave it my all. I laid my life down. I, I tried not to have a personal agenda. I can just hear Elijah. Look at Simon Peter. He had just seen the resurrected Lord. And at that moment, he had spent days. Jesus was coming back and forth, appearing to them. And he still, he could not forget where he'd been. He was tired. He, he, he said, I'm done. I just, I'm going to disappear. I'm going to go back to where it all started. I quit. I retire. I'm done. Look at Paul. He made a, stake, a statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's what he says. If we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure. He said, I can't even explain to you how heavy the burden was. It was actually so heavy, we did, it was above our strength. So that we were even in despair even of life. It was taking the life. It was sucking the life out of us. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises from the dead. In other words, he wanted to encourage us. He said, listen, at that moment, I felt all the life was being drained out of me. And if I was, felt like I was going to die, but at least I served the God who could raise me from the dead who delivered us, that was his past, from so great a death and does deliver us, which was his present, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us in the future. He went on to say in 2 Corinthians 7, watch this. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Not only was he battling every attack and every misunderstanding, every relational issue that could go wrong at one time, he's like, not only was that going on around me, but I was battling fear on the inside. There's not been one of us sitting here that there did not come a moment we didn't want to quit. And the, and, the, and the enemy is trying to cause us to get weary and even doing things that are good. If he can get weariness in your life and cause you to toil and be drugged into life, my friend, he will silence your voice and ultimately cause you to disappear from the scene and try to live it on your own. Is anybody hearing me today? That's this. Listen, if that's you today, I've got hope. If it's not you, welcome to your future. Is it, well, that's, that's really encouraging, preacher. No, I'm just saying this is life. Anyone who tells you when Jesus saves you, everything is fixed and nothing else is broken and nothing else needs help is trying to sell you a new tape series. No, life is, as Sean said last week, Jesus didn't come to take you out of it. He came to take you through it. And there is not one thing, as long as he's with you, what, what can man do to you? Watch this. So if you're with that right now, can I give you four quick things? Look around and see today you're not alone. There's not anyone sitting here that at one time in their life didn't want to quit. One of the greatest lessons, it's, it's one of the most difficult lessons to teach your children is if you start something, you're not going to stop. Don't quit. Don't stop. Keep going. However, learn from where you are so that you can have the strength to get where you're going. 
But look around you. Peter would say it this way, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as some strange thing that is just happening to you. You're not alone. So look around you, realize you're not alone. The second thing, cry out to God. There's an old phrase, big boys don't cry. Well, the cry of a heart will either bleed out of your eyes or bleed out every relationship you will ever have. I'm going to say that one more time. Listen, this thing of parents, and I, I know, I, I know, I can, I've counseled people for years. My dad wouldn't, he's, they would say, my dad wouldn't let me cry. He said, dry your tears up. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Well, there's, you're going to cry one way or the other. It's either going to come of that moment of brokenness and it comes out of your eyes and out of your heart or it will bleed into every relationship you will ever have and it will start putting a bitter root in those things because it's going to come out some way. But when you cry out to God, the psalmist David said in Psalm 55, I cried out to the Lord and he heard me and he answered my prayer. In Psalm 18, he said, I cried out. And to God, and he heard my voice from his temple. My cry went before him. It says in Psalm 30, oh Lord God, I cried out to you. I, I released what was honest inside of me, and you healed me. The third thing is hold on. Hold on to the promises. He said, if you ask me for bread, I'm not going to give you a stone. If you ask me for fish, I'm not going to give you a serpent. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more should your heavenly father give good things to them that ask? Just hold on because he is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that you could ask or think. And the fourth thing is worship while you walk. <laughs> worship while you walk. In everything give thanks. Sing a little praise on this side of the sea that's trying to keep you from where you're going. And you just start praising him where you are. Worship while you walk. And in everything, not some things, not just in the good stuff, in everything give thanks. So how can I give thanks when I want to quit? The thankful heart will start being louder than the quitter that wants to rise up. Just stay with me. And the fifth thing is this, and this is where I'm going to stay for not only this Sunday, but next Sunday. The fifth thing is to rest. Rest. Next week I'll talk about, I'm going to break down the word rest and what that signifies for us. But today I want to talk to you just these next few minutes, because that was kind of to get us here. If you're there, come on over here. Do you know it's a command to rest? Do you know that it was, it actually made the top 10 to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember Sabbath in the Hebrew, Shabbat, Sabbat, it actually just means rest. We'll read in a minute. I, I want to, but can I show you what Hebrews says? Hebrews 4 says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest, God's rest, also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Jesus, actually, he was actually a Sabbath follower. Now, as moment I mention that, many people get legalistic. They say, oh, well, that means we got to start keeping Saturday. That was the, that was the seventh day. That, that was the day of rest. It's not a day I want you to see, it's a person I want you to know. You can take a day and make sure, but God was very specific with us when he said, I worked six days and I rested. I rested on one. He didn't have to rest. He didn't exude any weakness. He was setting an example for us. Jesus would say the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He's Lord of rest. You ever been so tired you couldn't sleep, you couldn't think? Do you know that toiling in life will drain life? Working to honor God out of relationship with him will build life. But there's a pattern. 
There's something that many times we try to get the American dream. We go, 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 get, 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 get. We gotta train, 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 train. We, we, you, you know, you can't even get away from this, man. This becomes a slave driver. I mean, we get false vibrations. Man, I've had my left cheek just because <laughs> I keep my phone right here, man, all the time. And my, my cheek will vibrate. And I don't even have a phone there. And it's, and it's a true, it happens. Am I crazy? Does anybody vibrate without me? Okay. It's like, all right, we, we got some medication for you. And uh, listen to what God said in Exodus 20. He said, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall do no work at all, neither you nor your son, your daughter, nor your maid servant, your main servant, your animals, the alien, the one staying in your gate, staying with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Well, a lot of people are like, well, that's Old Testament. That's, well, I sure hope thou shalt not kill is not just Old Testament. What's amazing is we kind of look at the others and go, yeah, let's keep those in place. But more than a day, it was a placement of rest. It was a place of learning to know, to, a place to find shalom. A, pay, a place where you back up and you, you huddle up. You reflect on life, you reflect on him. A place where you give it a break. Because if you don't give it a break, it's going to break you. That's what toil will do in your life. It's this whole thing that God, do you know why God was establishing this? Because before this point, now watch, they have come through the wilderness. They've come to Mount Sinai. God is now giving them just the bearers, the standard of his holiness and the laws that are a part of approaching him. It's just revealing his nature, his character. But do you know why God is throwing this into them? Because they have just spent the last hundred, few hundred years making bricks. Brick, 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 make, make the brick, make the brick, make the brick. Bill Pharaoh's kingdom, everything toiling will always cause you to build the ego of yourself or someone else. It's all about ego. It's all about what man can do. And it's toil, toil, toil. And so for all those hundreds of years, make the brick, make the brick. Even when the, when the plagues were being released over Egypt, the very first thing he hit was how they made the bricks. And then he said, you go get your own straw. I'm not even furnishing the straw anymore. Make the brick, make the brick. Feed the ego, feed the, go, do, do. Pharaoh was working them to death. And now they come to a mountain to the presence of God. And he gives them the standard of his heart of how they would relate to him and how they would relate to others. But in the middle of it, in the fourth commandment, he's wanting them to know, I'm not a brick master. I don't have an ego to stroke. I have no need of anything. He brought them there to worship in the first place. Because when you align worship in your heart, it's not about what you can do for God. Worship is not what can I give him. Worship is, 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 is a response to what he has given me. And all I'm doing in worship is giving back what he has poured in me. He doesn't need my toil. He doesn't need my driven lifestyle that no one around you even likes to be around because you're driven all the time. Driven, driven, driven. Get it, get it, get it. 
It is a brick-making mentality. And what Holy Spirit is wanting to break in his church is a brick-making mentality. So we learn to work, to honor, to please, and we know how to have community, and we know how to rest in the one who it's all about anyway. Is anybody with me today? Watch this. He said in Exodus 20, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Part of the slave mentality was go, go. And he's finally telling them, no, I want to teach you to stop. I want to teach you to reflect. I want to teach you to rest. See, it was on the background that we understand the meaning of Sabbath. That means to rest. It goes beyond just commanding people. It actually reveals a powerful revelation of God himself. That his character, his nature, his love, when that's engaged It's amazing how busy we get. Busyness has nothing to do with godliness. Let me try this out over here. Busyness has nothing to do with godliness. It's learning the cadence of heaven. When we get the cadence of heaven in our life, it affects the cadence of our home. Too often we can get so caught up in the drive, in the toil. We can get so caught up in this brick-making mentality. We never put anything down. It's run, 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 constantly drive to thrive. You got to go, 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 grow, go to grow. We, we don't need kitchens in our homes anymore. We just need drive through windows. Because we spend so much time getting our kids everywhere. Getting, we got to get here. We got to go there. Get, <laughs> produce, produce, produce. Got to be the best. Got to be the best. Listen, I'm not talking about not being a person of excellence. But God set up the cadence of heaven. For not only us personally to be whole people, but to have whole families, to have strong churches, to have strong leaders, to have people of influence, people who know when to say yes, and they also know when to say "Ah, no. They know how to plug in, and they know when to unplug. They understand priority. What I've had to look at my life over these last few months is even in ministry, you can get so busy doing things, you just like, you know what? Um, it becomes a toil. An old preacher was asked recently, he said, what, how do you see the difference between when you pastored and now? And he said, oh, social media and everything has changed everything because now a pastor is judged online immediately by every other pastor. You can get anything, anything you want. I mean, you can go find it. You can attend anywhere. And now it just, we, we, we so pick and choose. I'm not talking about just church. I'm talking about in life. There's so many choices. We get confused and it becomes this toil, this laborious drag through the mud. And we're trying to remember the names of our kids. Hey, John, John, you're John, Joe, Joe. James, I only got one kid. I'm trying to. And God gave a Sabbath and he said, I want you to stop it. Just stop. I give you permission. Stop making the bricks. Come away with me. Build Let me build you strong and deep. Be who I've called you to be. I called you to work. I'll give you a strong work ethic, but I'll teach you. But 
I never called you. I broke the back of tolling. When sin came into the garden, now man by the sweat of his brow would work. But still, God gave him the cadence. He gave him the ability to learn. Do you know, to the Jewish people, one of the key elements that kept the Hebraic language, kept the culture for 2,000 years being dispersed, one of the main elements of God keeping them unified around the world was Shabbat. Because it was not based on some Gregorian calendar. It was based on the positioning of the moon. It was based on counting days, knowing it is Shabbat. It is time to sit back, unplug. It's time to be family. It's time to grow. It's time to worship together as a family. Let's, let's think about him. Let's think about each other. Let's love one another. Let's care. Let's unplug from everything trying to define us. And let's let the God who created us be our definition. See, the enemy is striving to wear you down with toil and trouble, to wear us out, to distract us. Johnny, if you would come. To distract us from a heavenly perspective. Someone sent me a scripture the other day, yesterday. It's out of 1 John. It's a scripture. I, I love 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. I love the gospel of John. It's, it's actually, I probably, I, I've read only God knows how many times through those, the gospel and through those three letters. Here's what John said. He said, we know that we are of God. That's a good knowledge. We know we're of God. And something else we know, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Stephen De Silva, in his book, Money and Pros the Prosperous Soul, he did a word search and a word study on the word evil one which I found was so intriguing. He said, what is amazing in the Greek, it's actually mentioned 10 times in the New Testament, evil one. And it actually means in that verse, to toil. So he wanted to put it in perspective. So he, everywhere it mentioned in the New Testament, evil one, he put the word toil that drag through that extremely hard incessant to drag or to struggle that this world is bound by the evil one and he replaced the term evil one with toil listen at these scriptures Matthew 13 19 when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it Toil comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one whom the seed was sown beside the road. He says in Matthew 13, 38, the other description, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of toil. It says in John 17, 15, I do not ask you, Father, to take them out of the world, but keep them from toil. It says in Ephesians 6, 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of toil. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen, he will protect you from toil. Is anybody hearing this? It says in 1 John 2, 13, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome toil. <laughs> I've written to you children because you know the father. He wanted to say in verse 14, I've written to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. You have overcome toil. 1 John 3, 12. Not as Cain, who was of toil and slew his brother. 
And for that reason did he slay him. Because his deeds were evil, his brothers were righteous. 1 John 5, 18. We know that no one is born of God's sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and toil does not touch him. Then that passage I gave you. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of toil, the evil one. See, toil is not the same thing again as work. But it's that dragging you through that you want to quit. You want to disappear. Never, never can find the cadence of this relationship, this walk with God. I had to look and see how much time I was spending doing things. Even as a pastor, and I'm like, I don't, I don't study the word and pray because I'm a pastor. It's because I'm a son. If all I ever do is to go to this, his book just to get a message or a sermon, then I'm just sermonizing. You can get that anywhere. But if I've given time to dig into his heart to know him, then I'm not speaking out of what I've read, I'm speaking from who I know. And I just want to know him. I don't want busyness to keep me. I had to look, I had to repent to God. I, I saw so many things were distracting me. What breaks my heart is, man, so often I watch people, even today, if you've been watching the clock, I, I know there's a football game. I know there's football, and there's football, and then there's football, and then there's basketball. Used to, you had a break between sports. Now there's no break. They all mix together. You even got guys wanting to play it all. I'm not against sports. I love, I, I enjoy a ball game. But if I can quote all the stats on every player, and I can tell you their waist size, I can give you all their stats of batting averages, and I can tell you everything about them, but I can't quote two scriptures. I, I can't spend an hour with God. I can't spend time with God. I am so consumed and glued to a test, to a tube that is defining me. And I say, hey, I got time, but you're sucking it up with everything else. And if we don't give him our time, we will never know the God who wants to know us. It's just smoke and mirrors, man. He's real. And he looked at Israel and said, I'm going to deliver you. I'll set you free. But I want you to know me. I want time with you. You received communion cups when you came in. Would you take those out? I want to show you something. I want to show you something that I, I've never seen after. Only God knows how many times I've read the resurrection story and how many times through the years. That's not some pat on the That's just years of reading. But I found something last week that I had this epiphany. I'm so thankful God's never had an epiphany. He's never had a moment he went, uh, oh, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know that. <laughs> but he gives us those moments, and that's why I saved communion to the end today. I didn't mean to in the first service. I kind of forgot. And I got to this point, and I realized why I had forgotten, because he wanted you to have it here. God worked for six days. He created everything. He created a nursery for us in a garden. He did it for his pleasure. Every good and perfect word, 
perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. It was good to him. But he created all of this for us. That we could have fellowship and walk in the cool of a day to know him. But on the seventh day, he said, I want to teach you my principle. He rested. He reflected over his creation. I don't know, it must have been, was it Sabbath, was it Shabbat? When God came walking in the cool of the day to have communion and fellowship, it, it, it had to be a special portion of the day. He goes and he has, he's talking, he's looking for Adam, but Adam's nowhere to be found. Do you know that when Jesus came, Two of the main things that hung him on the cross was what he did on Sabbath. He healed on Sabbath. He was showing what the Sabbath was about. It wasn't made for, Sabbath was made for man. It was for man to enjoy, to rest. It wasn't to have all these rules and regulations. It was to unplug, but yet it was to do good. Anytime you see Jesus doing a miracle on Sabbath, he was always attacked for that. He would always bring the alignment of what it was all about. The second thing hung him on the cross was him saying he's the son of God. So one was what happened on the Sabbath, the other that he said he was the son of God. Hung him on a cross. While he was on that cross, the sun started going down that Friday at Passover. Jesus with a loud voice to tell us, die. It's finished. I'm done. And he breathed his last breath. They got him off the cross quickly. Why? Shabbat is coming. Sabbath is about to happen. They quickly get him in a tomb. They they don't even have time to really fix his body upright. They they wrap him quickly. Why? It's time for rest. And God fulfilled again. When he said, I'm finished, he said, I'm going for Shabbat. And the time they rolled that stone in front of him, Shabbat Shalom, peace. He was finished. He had worked. Now he was done. He rested and said, I am the Sabbath. I am your rest. What we hold in our hands are the elements of Sabbath, communion. It's always been about communion covenant. We're going to talk in March. I want you to know what covenant is. That we're a covenant people. It's the blood of the new covenant. What is the covenant? There there are these things he's given you access to. And it's all because of what we hold in our hands. It's because God rested. And he said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I don't don't require you to make bricks. I don't need you to build my image. I came to build who you are. I need you. I want you to know me. This has always been about communion. It's always been about fellowship. And no one has ever had that kind of communion and fellowship with him that it doesn't affect my family. I I sat here today and almost couldn't get up for a moment because I watched my little grandson dancing beside me. And I remembered his dad dancing beside me. And you have the world, you you have it, man. But to know I can... Out of everything, every attack, the moments I wanted to disappear and just go away and quit, give up, walk out. I'm like, God, this is no, no. And he says, come here, Rusty. 
I can give you rest in the middle of all of that. You can be standing in the middle of voices screaming at you and there is a peace that goes beyond what you're able to understand or comprehend because I am Shalom Shabbat. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Come here. Dear God, when I watch my grandkids and I watch my children and I watch your children and I watch them, there is nothing worth losing that. It, it, if it's, what does it matter in eternity? Whatever matters in eternity matters now. Please hear me. Don't let the toil of the evil one Weary you, weigh you. It's time to learn to rest. He did. He took the bread, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. His body was broken, he gave gifts to me. What an amazing Jesus. That I was created to display his wonder and his beauty. To know him. God, I pray you would bless this bread today. Let it spiritually become the body of our Lord. That even healings would take place in lives, restored minds, clarity for because God, when we're weary, been drugged through, it's hard to even make decisions. It's hard to heal anything. You call us to know you. Come away, Shabbat. Rest. Commune with me. Bless this, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's eat together. Would you stand with me? The blood of the new covenant. Forgiveness then. Forgiveness now. Freedom then. Freedom now. He said, I will not drink the fruit of the cup again until I drink it with you in the presence of my Father. So we salute you, O King. I say to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to the only wise God, be blessing and glory and honor, power forever and ever. I pray if you don't know Jesus today, I pray, I beg you that you would just turn, repent, just turn to him right now. Say, God, I'm not gonna keep on living the way I am. I give you my life, forgive me, come into my life. It's more than just a prayer, it's the position of a heart, it's a surrendered life. He comes to change us. His blood redeemed us. We were not redeemed with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb you can receive today. Let this spiritually become the blood of our Lord as we receive together. Let's drink. Amen. Can I encourage you to do something? There were a lot of notes I put on the app today. I want you to go study. If you're single, if you're Go study this. Know to live out of a place. Tomorrow, next Sunday, I'm going to be talking on the breakdown of rest. I'm not talking about just a day, but find a day. Find a day that when, as a family, as individuals, it's how community is truly built. It's how we grow together. I'm sorry, I need you not for a status on social media, 
I don't do that. I need you because you're my brother and my sister. We get to do life together. It's amazing. You say, well, I don't know you. I just get to hear you preach. I show up Monday night, Wednesday night. I hang out here all the time. I'm, I'm here all the time. I have a, she refuses to let me put a bed in the office. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to do that. No. But we get to know each other as we grow together. And if you don't know Jesus today, here's how I'm going to close, and I'm about to dismiss you. We're going to have some leaders up here. I ask you, please don't leave the way you came. You don't have to. We've had some amazing altar times over these past few weeks. And today I felt led to end in communion and just release you today. But if you need prayer, we've got leaders here to pray with you. Did you get anything out of this today? I should please.